pseudoscience pretends to be scientific, but promotes unsupported, false, or even unfalsifiable claims. We're more likely to fall for pseudoscience when we're in need of hope or easy answers to difficult problems. And because pseudoscience is driven by a desire to believe, we lower our standard of evidence. But it's not harmless. Falling for pseudoscience can risk our health, waste our money, and erode our trust in science. The good news is we can protect ourselves with science literacy. So let's learn to recognize key characteristics of pseudoscience to avoid being fooled. Scientific claims must be falsifiable, which means they could potentially be proven wrong. Scientists then design studies to disprove, not prove, their hypotheses, and claims are only accepted when they've repeatedly withstood attempts at falsification. In contrast, many pseudoscientific claims are unfalsifiable. Some are too vague to test. For example, by law, supplements can't make specific health claims, so instead they make broad generic claims like boosts the immune system, or improves overall health and wellness. That might sound great, but it doesn't actually say anything. Others make supernatural claims that, by definition, can't be empirically tested. For example, while energy is measurable and observable and therefore scientific, energy medicine proposes that an unmeasurable or not yet observed life force or healing energy flows through the body. But if no evidence could ever disprove a claim, any evidence that appears to support it is irrelevant as it's not an evidence-based claim. There's a reason science journals aren't full of anecdotes like, I saw Bigfoot, so I know it's real. Or, I know homeopathy works because I tried it and I felt better. Our experiences can fool us. Imagine you have a headache drink an herbal tea, and your headache goes away. Was it the tea? Maybe. But maybe you had a stress headache, and drinking a hot liquid relaxed you. Or maybe the headache was caused by dehydration, and the liquid rehydrated you. Maybe it was the placebo effect. Or maybe the headache simply went away on its own. To know if the herbal tea treats headaches, scientists would recruit a large number of participants and randomly assign them to two groups, where one drinks the herbal tea and the other a placebo tea, and importantly, not tell them which group they were in. Only if participants in the herbal tea group report improvements beyond the placebo group can we say that the herbal tea is effective. The process of science works in part because it recognizes and controls for the ways that we can fool ourselves. But these experiments are time-consuming and expensive. There's a reason pseudoscience promoters rely heavily on anecdotes. They're cheap and effective. Remember, anecdotes aren't sufficient evidence, so don't let someone convince you that a treatment worked with vivid stories and emotional testimonials. Imagine a cherry tree where each cherry represents a piece of evidence for a claim and all the cherries represent the body of evidence. It's possible to cherry pick evidence to support nearly any position and miss the bigger picture. For example, every living thing needs liquid water. But what if I told you that all serial killers have admitted to drinking water or that it's the primary ingredient in many toxic pesticides or that drinking too much water can lead to death. By selectively choosing these facts, we're left with a distorted and inaccurate view of water's importance for life. In science, different studies provide varying types and qualities of evidence. Results need to be confirmed through replication. The strongest conclusions are supported by various lines of evidence. The point is, the body of evidence is much more reliable than any individual study. Pseudoscience often cherry-picks individual studies, often of low quality, to support a desired conclusion. But that's not how science works. To determine if a claim is true, we have to consider the whole tree. Pseudoscience mimics the language of science using technobabble, which sounds scientific, but doesn't make sense. For example, a bioelectric field enhancement technology foot and hand bath sold online for about $3,000 
claims that sine wave filtered auditory stimulation is carefully designed to encourage maximal orbitofrontal dendritic development. Whew, that may sound impressively scientific, but it's a word salad. Importantly, all scientific fields have technical jargon that helps experts communicate with other experts. But most people don't have the expertise in these areas to understand these terms and assume those using them know what they're talking about. Jargon makes sense to experts. Technobabble doesn't. Scientific claims must have a logical way of explaining how they might work, given our existing knowledge. In contrast, many pseudoscientific claims are far-fetched, as they defy basic scientific laws and theories. A great example is homeopathy, which is based on the idea that a substance that causes symptoms will treat the same symptoms, but only if it's extremely diluted. For example, need help falling asleep? Take a coffee remedy that's been diluted until there are literally zero molecules of caffeine left. How might this work? According to homeopaths, Supposedly, the water molecules remember the substance. These claims violate nearly everything we know about chemistry and physics. Extraordinary claims that don't fit with how we know the world works are a red flag of pseudoscience. The process of science weeds out bad ideas and builds on good ones. For example, for centuries, doctors thought that illnesses were caused by imbalances of the four humors, or body liquids, water, blood, black bile, and yellow bile. The treatment, bloodletting and vomiting. In the 19th century, Austrian physician Josef Dietl found that pneumonia patients who were treated were three times more likely to die than those who weren't treated. Scientific progress is why your doctor doesn't cut you when you're sick. In contrast, pseudoscience stubbornly clings to disproven ideas and resists updating even after being thoroughly refuted. Consider iridology, which claims health conditions can be diagnosed by observing the patterns of color in the iris. As the story goes, in the 1840s, Hungarian physician Ignaz von Pizzoli's owl broke its leg. Pizzoli noticed the flecks of color in the bird's eye before and after its leg healed. And from this observation, modern iridology was born. Despite these claims having no plausible mechanism and being thoroughly disproven, the pseudoscience of iridology lives on. Science changes with evidence, and that's a good thing. Sometimes modern science doesn't have the answers we're looking for. And in our desperate need for hope, pseudoscience can fool us by offering easy and simple solutions. For example, while losing weight isn't easy and takes time, a detox might claim you can lose 20 pounds a week without dieting or exercising. Some claims are downright dangerous, such as diets that say they can cure cancer. They can't. In science, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. Pseudoscience sounds too good to be true because often it is. Science doesn't provide absolute proof and all conclusions are open to change with new evidence. Scientists acknowledge this uncertainty and are careful not to overstate findings. Pseudoscience promoters often present ideas simply and with great confidence, regardless of the lack of evidence. Whereas a medical doctor may tell you a test suggests a certain diagnosis and possible treatments may have certain benefits, but that there's a chance of some side effects. A pseudoscience promoter would definitively tell you what you have and tell you exactly what product or service would cure it, which is often something they're selling. Uncertainty might be uncomfortable, but it's the more honest position. Logical fallacies are flaws in reasoning that weaken or invalidate an argument. Unfortunately, they can be quite persuasive, something that pseudoscience promoters use to their advantage. Some of the more common fallacies in pseudoscience are the appeal to nature, which claims something is good 
or safe because it's perceived to be natural. The appeal to tradition, which asserts that something is good or true because it's been around for a long time. The argument from ignorance, where a lack of an explanation is treated as evidence. And the ad hominem, which attacks the source of an argument rather than the evidence. The point is, scientific arguments must be logical and based in evidence. Because pseudoscience lacks evidence, it relies on logical fallacies to persuade instead. A key part of science is peer review, in which studies must pass scrutiny by other experts before they're published in scientific journals. Peer review is like a roller coaster with ups and downs and twists and turns. And just when you think it's over, there's another loop. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Pseudoscience avoids this hurdle by making claims directly to the public through books, websites, TV, and social media. Many pseudoscientists are very effective self-promoters, but charisma isn't evidence. To make things worse, the media often repeat these claims uncritically. If you're not a scientist, it could be difficult to know which claims have passed peer review and which haven't. Most people have better things to do with their time than read scientific journals. Science requires scrutiny. Pseudoscience can't withstand the scrutiny, so they avoid it. Science is a community of experts gathering evidence and scrutinizing claims. Criticism is harsh, but necessary, and ideas are only accepted after they've survived the gauntlet of experts trying to shoot them down. Pseudoscientists exist outside the scientific community because their claims can't pass this scrutiny. So instead of trying to make their case with evidence, they claim scientists are involved in a conspiracy to suppress the truth. It's the get out of jail free card for the fact that nearly every expert disagrees with you. To make matters worse, many pseudoscientists present themselves as a lone hero fighting for victims who've been prevented from hearing the truth. For example, a common pseudoscience claim is that natural cures are being suppressed. But maintaining such a conspiracy would require the involvement of nearly the entire scientific community in academia, industry, and government in nearly every country on earth. Would you keep a secret that juicy? I wouldn't, especially when discovering a miraculous cure would be the best way to make a name for myself as a scientist. I'd have fame, fortune, and a Nobel Prize. And keep in mind that those pointing a finger at the supposedly greedy scientists are almost always trying to sell you something without providing evidence. The bottom line is pseudoscience pretends to be scientific, but doesn't adhere to the methodology that makes science reliable. Learning to recognize pseudoscience and how it differs from science empowers us to make informed decisions and not waste our time, money, or help.